All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but in nearly every instance, the establishment media has gotten every single thing wrong about this primary. Just think about it. First, they thought Beto was going to be a phenom who would challenge Bernie with young voters. The Washington Post, Jennifer Rubin, wrote of Beto. He could well drag Sanders down in the polls, stealing away young, aspirational voters, compared with Sanders' angry man routine and other candidates telling us that practically everything in the United States is terrible and must change. O'Rourke might come as a breath of fresh air. Crack political analyst Harry Enten and Chris Saliza launched the primary campaign with a set of rankings that put Kamala first and Beto second, writing, It's Beto's world and every other Democrat is just living in it. Kamala was given the top spot over Beto, though, primarily for her identity as an Indian-American and African-American woman. Turnout voters cared a lot more about her shifting policy stances and status quo ideology. The unanimous pundit acclaim for Amy Klobuchar's debate performances has become an almost certain post-debate ritual. Countless puff pieces were proffered about how Klobuchar was surging at just the right time. Here's one example of that genre from Politico, which proclaimed, the surge is real. Klobuchar makes late push in Iowa. This all culminated in the almost theatrical absurdity of The New York Times deciding to endorse Amy Klobuchar, a candidate with a near zero chance of winning while lauding her Midwestern charisma. Meanwhile, candidates the public found genuinely interesting, like Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard, who were consistently the most Googled after their debate performances, were either ignored or they were smeared so that they never had a chance to overcome the media blackout and bias that was hung like a rock around their campaigns. But the consistent theme throughout the primary has been the media's lack of love for the two candidates that the public feels the most love for, Bernie and Biden. The bias against them stems in part from ageism, classism, and constant media obsession with the new, new thing. From the beginning, the media assumed that Biden's support was soft and set to crumble at any second. Back in July, time went with this piece about how Joe Biden is struggling, writing, six months before the Iowa caucuses, Biden looks like the shakiest frontrunner in years. A 76-year-old man who joined the Senate during the Nixon administration increasingly seems out of step in a primary dominated by questions of race, gender, and inequality. Of course, his lead has persisted many, many months past the publishing of that doomsday piece. But none has been underestimated more than Bernie Sanders. The media class held him in complete contempt because of an ideological opposition to the type of politics he espouses, politics that could fundamentally shift power away from them, from their advertisers and their affluent consumers. Their own social circles allowed them to maintain this delusion, after all. Their friends didn't support Bernie. In fact, their friends hate Bernie. So everyone must hate Bernie, right? How could anyone possibly support him over the much more erudite Liz Warren? I think, you know, having Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren next to each other will really highlight, because for me, as, you know, again, I'm not the political analyst here, but just as a woman, probably considered a somewhat moderate Democrat, I, Bernie Sanders makes my skin crawl. And I can't even identify for you what exactly it is, but I, I see him as sort of a, a not pro-woman candidate. Some brilliant analysis there. <laughs> they chose not to cover polls in which he was doing well, or they crafted headlines that made sure not to mention Bernie at all. You all know my personal favorite for a poll in which Bernie led. Pete Buttigieg in fourth, but a strong fourth. Pundits predicted with great confidence that he would drop out of the race before the voting even began. I mean, if you were to create the worst possible three-week period for his presidential campaign, it would be the launch of the person you share the most ideological space with, Elizabeth Warren, and the fact you've had to defend yourself against the perception that your supporters are very anti-woman. Uh, he's done. And I literally, I was really? yeah, you think he's, he's done? I, I think wow. he's done. I, I was literally having this discussion with a good uh, contact of mine who's on the campaign. I was like, I see Bernie Sanders uh, launching his campaign and by August realizing he won't be in the top five in Iowa and dropping out. I don't think he'll get that far. He's done. Perhaps though, the perfect encapsulation of the complete media obliviousness and miscalculation came at last week's debate. CNN was so in the tank for Warren that they blatantly took her side in accusing Bernie of lying about whether he said a woman couldn't win the presidency. You're saying that you never told Senator Warren that a woman could not win the election. That is correct. Senator Warren, what did you think when Senator Sandru Sanders told you a woman could not win the election? <laughs> 
Now afterwards, Warren was of course declared a winner of the debate. Bernie was declared a loser. Their own tokenist identity politics told them that Warren's sexism complaint was going to be critical to voters. Their hatred for Bernie told them that voters too would judge him a sexist and feel all the negative ways about him that they do. But they couldn't have been more wrong. Post debate. CNN has him leading nationally. A new California poll has him jumping up to a lead. A New Hampshire poll has him gaining 14 points. And Elizabeth Warren hasn't benefited from her traitorous attack one tiny bit. Now, after 2016, you would have thought that maybe, just maybe, the media would have learned a tiny bit of humility. They were wrong, after all, about Bernie's strength in that primary. They were wrong about Trump in the primary. And of course, ultimately, they were completely wrong about Trump in the general. You would have thought that maybe there would be some little bit of self-reflection about what wrong assumptions they'd made, about what issues actually matter to American voters. But instead, they fixated on making excuses for Hillary's loss. Well, it was Russia. Well, it was Comey. Well, it was sexism. And let me tell you, all of these things are real things. Don't get me wrong. But they never stopped to ask why it would have been so close in the first place that a Comey presser or a few million dollars in Russian Facebook ads could swing the entire race. And so here we are. Now it is 2016 all over again, with the media having finally realized that they were completely wrong all those times they said Bernie should drop out, and Bernie was failing, and Bernie was angry and divisive, or as the white liberal id put it, nobody likes him. There are only 10 days now until the Iowa caucus. 10 days. The race has narrowed to two candidates that the media never took seriously. And once again, even though it was obvious to most of America, the media is stunned and shocked. They never bothered to open their eyes to the world around them. Once again, they never saw it coming. It is remarkable how consistently wrong these people, you can almost set your clock, like whatever they say is gonna happen, bet on the opposite. Yeah, they're literally a negative indicator. Yeah, it's like whatever it's they truly. think, like bet. Go the other way. <laughs> the opposite way. It, yeah, it's just, it's truly just deja vu to 2016. But more than anything, it's about all of the years in between in which even right now, what is every major network in the country doing right now? They have spent all this money doing impeachment coverage. They, you know, all the net, the anchors are down from New York. They have their special live. I mean, throughout the entire three years of the Trump presidency, was there any reckoning, not just with their own coverage, but with the the real issues as to why all of this happened in the first place? No. I was there in the White House briefing room. I remember what they asked about every single time, about Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen and all this just crap every single day. I'm not saying these aren't legit stories, but like, what, what, what was, uh, I would even be in briefings with the economic advisor. Do you think anybody asked about the manufacturing index or about decline or about any of that? Nothing. It was all just astroturf and it was faux cable news segments that they were trying to get. Same thing in all of their analysis. And what they have papered over is an American public that has been sold out by the entire city by the entire, by the government for years and years and years. And they can't tell that story. Well, and they have such a blind spot for any kind of working class support. Yeah. So, I mean, with Bernie, with Trump, this is clearly manifest. And Bernie and Trump both have politics that they find objectionable, abhorrent, doesn't fit, fit with their ideology. But you even see it with Joe Biden. I mean, you played that great clip mm -hmm. of the security guard in the elevator who gives him a hug, who they wants to take him. a selfie. Yeah. And they completely erase that support as well. And never really dig in to try to understand it or take it seriously as a real thing either. And ultimately, it's it's proven to be very durable against, you know, against all the odds, against, you know, the sort of Kamala's flailing attacks or Cory Booker's flailing attacks, et cetera. None of that has really shaken that sense of trust from a certain community with Joe Biden. I think that's really been dismissed as well. So it just goes to show you there is this complete contempt for, blind spot for, ignorance of any kind of sentiment that comes from the working class. Yeah, they don't understand, right? I mean, let's it doesn't they, penetrate their social no, bubble. They can and never so that's understand how a woman like that or, you know, somebody in Michigan or whatever could, could just, could put 
their experiences uh, and see somebody like Biden who served with Obama or even fought, you know, for many of the things, you know, like rhetorically, he's always generally been pretty good. And they can't understand the affinity that comes from that. And this, the feeling that somebody has actually fought and for their interests and is one of them, I think is very important. It's to funny because, you know, we talk about the, the hollowness of the type of identity politics they do where they yeah. just go like, you know, oh, Kamala's a black woman, right. so black people are going to support her when actually people of color have overwhelmingly supported the two old white guys, Bernie and Biden, who they There's just dismissively wrote off, right? But a kind of perfect encapsulation of that is a new poll came out of voters under 30. And guess who ties for last place among young voters? Pete Buttigieg. The youngest candidate in the race. So kind of tells you everything. That's funny. Next up on Rising, journalist in front of the show, Matt Taibbi, is going to join us with his thoughts on impeachment and also an update on what's going on with Glenn Greenwald. That is next.